This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by. Well, I wanted to thank you for having me here today. So, uh, as you can see, the topic today is beyond Yoast. So, the assumption here is that most of us are using Yoast, which a lot of us, that's kind of been the, the de facto standard for WordPress optimization. There's also other ones like All in One. Uh, but the nice thing is, I'm not going to be talking about it, so it doesn't really matter. So this is going to be covering everything else beyond that. So seven critical steps for optimizing your WordPress site beyond Yoast. Okay, so what I will cover is, so what, what the plan is for you to leave with is the five pillars of SEO that I've found that has driven success for all the clients we've worked with. Okay, that's the first thing. Number two, how do you put these into uh, some kind of framework? So there's a structure. So to have success, I always found that when you have an organized way of doing that, instead of just doing it haphazardly, uh, you'll have a lot more success. So we're going to talk about developing a framework for optimizing WordPress. Uh, I'll give you some tips on the tools and resources we use at Big Fish Results. We look at some best practices, so how do you actually apply these? So you may know uh, the framework, you might have some ideas on the tools to use, but how do you actually put this into practice, right? That's the most important thing, is actually applying what you learn. And I will give you some real life examples of how we've used this on various sites, okay? Uh, so a little bit about Big Fish. So Big Fish is the agency I founded. We're based out of Rhode Island. Our mission is to grow market leaders online so that our clients can be the big fish in their respective market. So what does that mean? Well, big fish, a big fish is a great fish. So our intention is to build a great company and also help our clients become great companies in their market. So we do that by working with market leaders in that, in that uh, niche, whether it's number one, two, or three. Uh, it does include some big brand experience. So I come from working with the best of the best. So ADP, I used to run their program. I worked with Ford Motor Company, General Motors. So about a dozen Fortune 500 companies, as well as many of my team, has worked at that level. And so we're basically bringing those strategies, tools, and tactics to local, small, and mid-sized businesses. Uh, we work exclusively with uh, a partner in a market. So we only work with one select partner. And what we do is apply, deploy a marketing system. And so R WordPress, our methodology, is part of that system. Now our system is in four components. One, attract customers or clients. So that's, SEO is certainly part of that because that's how you're driving awareness in your market and you're also driving traffic. Lure is driving engagement, which is so important, especially for optimization, right? Because you want to build trust in your marketplace and you want to drive engagement, which coincidentally also is a factor for Google ranking. And then finally, catch really is where you're driving sales opportunities. This is where you get someone to take action, whether that's a form submission, as a lead, whether it's a phone call, maybe it's downloading some content, that's catch, and then finally measurement. What you don't measure, you can't improve. So we benchmark our clients against their competitors, uh, we look at things like call tracking, and more importantly, we delve into analytics. So that's us in a nutshell, I just wanna give you a background who I am, so you can kinda of understand where we're coming from. So, what are the five pillars of SEO success? So these are the five pillars I found over the years having optimized websites since 1997, believe it or not. Uh, number one, accessibility. You got great content, you have great links, but if the search engines can't read your content in the first place, you're not gonna get back. So we're gonna talk about how do you make your content more accessible for your WordPress site. Uh, number two, your content. So what is your content strategy? And how does that uh, deploy within your WordPress site? So if they can't see the content, it's not going to be effective, but you also want to have good content. So what exactly do you write about, and how is it uh, optimized for the search engines? We're going to talk about links. So links are a big criteria for the search engines. So links kind of act like votes, right? So if you have good links, it means that people found quality content, and that's a huge signal for the search engines. Another thing that's important is your brand name. One part of that is social. So having your brand mentioned throughout the internet, on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera, that's a signal nowadays, and you can deploy different tactics within your WordPress site to optimize that. 
And then lastly, behavior. This is one a lot of people miss. So how people react on your site, whether they stay there, whether they're engaged, all these things come into play for optimizing your site. And they also, coincidentally, drive a better return on investment for you. So if people are staying on your site, they trust you, they're reading your content, not only are you going to have better SEO and better rankings, but they're probably more likely to engage with you and buy your products, call you for your services, et cetera. And really, isn't that what everything all comes down to, right? So that's what we're going to talk about. So first thing you do, so first thing we do when we take on any project is we come up with a methodology to, to monitor, to analyze it. And so many times that starts with analytics, right? So Google Analytics is kind of ubiquitous. Uh, and this is a great place to start. Uh, so you can use many plugins. One that's great is Yoast because, you know, we're not talking about Yoast SEO. It doesn't mean I can't talk about Yoast Analytics. So this is a good place to, to deploy your analytics code. And from an SEO perspective, what do you want to look for? Well, you want to understand, number one, where are people coming from? What's the percentage of people that are coming directly to your site from a URL, uh, putting your URL in, or from email, or from SEO, you know, from Google? Or, you know, where are they coming from when you delve down another level, right? So what specific keyword drove them there? What particular channel drove them there? So you can say social media, but which social channel? Is it Facebook? Is it YouTube? Is it uh, Pinterest, et cetera? Once they get there, you want to understand the behavior. So what is the bounce rate? So are people coming to your site and leaving immediately? That's a bounce rate. And if the bounce rate is high, guess what? Uh, that's not a good signal for Google. Because you want to have that number as low as possible. It's one of the few numbers you actually want to go down. Because that means people are, are staying there longer. How long are people staying on your site? So are they coming immediately and getting the answer they want? Are they staying longer reading your content? Uh, what exactly is the scenario there? It's going to be different for every industry. So there's no one size fit all. Because the question I always get is how long should someone stay on your site? Well, it depends on what kind of site you have. So. Um, if I have a, let's see, if I'm a, a mechanic, right, and I specialize in helping people whose car is broken down on the side of the road, I probably don't want someone reading all my content, right? I want them calling me so I can tow their car away, right? So that's going to be different from if you're a business to business marketer and you want them to read all your content for an extended period of time. Uh, page views per visit, how many pages they're looking at, what pages are important. And, and what is the most popular content? Because the content that's popular, you can then optimize similar content and get success. So a lot of times I found where you have success, you want to put more effort into because then you can replicate the results and get even better results. So that's really what I'm talking about in terms of popular content. Uh, the next thing I like to install is Google Webmaster Tools. This is very easy to do. You can actually install this through the Yoast plugin. Uh, there's other plugins as well where you can put it directly into the theme. Uh, but what I like to look at here are what are your search queries? So what are people clicking on? What's the click through rate? How many impressions are you getting? Because impressions are precursor to a result. So a lot of times you can look at leading indicators and lag indicators. So everyone likes to look at the lag indicators. Lag indicators are how many visits I got, how many people bought for a house. But a good uh, leading indicator is impressions. Because somewhat you have to get impressions in the search results before you can actually get rankings. You have to be in the database in the first place, right? It makes perfect sense. So why not track that? You can do that today through Google Webmaster Central. Uh, security and speed, so they can give you alerts if you've been hacked. They can also have some great speed tests. I know we already spent a lot of time on that, but there's some great uh, tools for speed. Uh, and you can look at indexation. So what percentage of pages are actually indexed within your results, and how is the crawl rate going? So are, are the search engines traversing your site or calling your site to consume your content? Are they looking at your new content? All this information comes into play as you come up with your optimizations, optimization strategy. Keyword research. So this is kind of the foundation, right? So you have uh, an idea of what's going on with your sites, with your analytics. You kind of know what you need to do uh, from a code perspective, perhaps. But you know, what do you want to show up for? So great tool. Most of us may or may not know this, but a good place to start is called the Google Keyword Planner. And the Google Keyword Planner is great because you can put in your landing page 
you put your competitor's landing page, you put a couple keywords in here, and boom, it spits out what are the most popular searches, how many are done locally within uh, your market, so in the United States in this case, uh, what's the level of competition from a paid search perspective, which is a good idea, a good indicator of how competitive it is from an SEO perspective. And so a good place to start in any SEO is starting with the research, with the keywords. Uh, whoops. Uh, the other one I'll hit on, and we'll spend a ton of time on this, but making sure your site is mobile friendly. At this point, you know, uh, most of us should have mobile sites. If you don't, I would recommend doing that sooner than later. And so that's important because a higher and higher percentage of people are looking at websites from their mobile phones. In some industries, it can be 70%. And so if you're not optimized for that, not only is it bad user experience, but it also is a, is a negative signal to Google because they are optimizing for users too. The same thing we're trying to do, optimize our sites for our users. Guess what? Google's doing the same thing. And so what I found, the best way to get best results for yourself is to get the best results for your users, which is coincidentally the same thing Google's trying to do. So if you do that, you'll have success. Uh, so in terms of accessibility, uh, you won't, one, one of the first things you want to do is, is look at your robots text file. And if this is not properly uh, optimized, you can actually block the search engine from seeing it. So believe it or not, a lot of large sites have had their traffic disappear because you know, a developer goes in there, changes the robots text not knowing it, and uh, you know, the sites are gone. I actually worked on one Fortune 500 company once, and uh, they, their site was this kind of a funny story. Because I told you I'd tell you some stories throughout this. There's a Fortune 500 company, I can't even tell you which one, because they'd be embarrassed, but it was in the top 100. And they had a site that was getting so much traffic that, and this was probably 10 years ago, but the developers couldn't handle it. The, the, the site kept on crashing. So the solution the developers had was let's block the traffic. Problem solved, right? <laughs> so, so this was uh, something I dealt with. And, of course, they didn't tell me that. I had to delve into it. So this just goes to the fact, don't assume that this is fine, because there might actually be a problem there, and you want to be aware of that. Uh, so these can also acquire page rank, which is kind of a signal to Google of your uh, link quality. Um, another problem. So we're talking right now about accessibility, one of the top uh, pillars here. Uh, so what is duplicate content? Duplicate content is essentially having the same content in multiple places, on, primarily on your website, although it could be on other websites. So number one, you want to make sure you have unique content. Don't buy content somewhere that someone's repurposed 20 times over. Uh, make sure you have unique page titles. So the title tag within your search results, you want to make sure that's unique. You want to have unique meta descriptions. So meta descriptions are descriptions that describe the content within on that page. Uh, if you do a search in Google and you get the results, the first link, the first part of that uh, listing is your title tag. The part under that is the description. So you want to make sure that's unique. And a lot of times it's good to have a call to action, like visit our site to get a coupon. Who went, it makes it more, the user more likely to click on it because it adds value to the user. Post excerpts, uh, you know, that's another place where you got some problems with your, your, your blog. Uh, no index, no follows. These are a little bit technical, but uh, you can have some issues there. You want to make sure you uh, no follow content, no index content. It can be possibly a duplicate canonical URL. That's kind of a fancy term, but basically it's just telling the search engines to reference one kind of one piece of the content. So if you're doing an e-commerce site and you have multiple iterations of uh, the product showing up, which is a fancy term people use is faceted search. So if you go on Amazon, you click the little variations. You know, I want a sweater in red. I want sweater in, in green, you know, sometimes the URL can say red sweater or it can say green sweater. These are called faceted search, and this can cause a lot of problems for the search engines. So essentially you want to make sure the search engines only see one iteration of that URL. Uh, www uh, versus non -dub -dub, you want to make sure that you redirect uh, the, to the pro uh, predominant version. So if the Google is already indexing one version, a lot of times that indicates it's got higher <coughs> page rank or you know, links point to it. So a lot of times we'll redirect the one version to the other. And uh, you want to make sure you're consistent in the WordPress settings. So there's an example in the screenshot there of what that would look in the WordPress backend. 
duplicate content. Uh, so continuing on this, just some other areas you can have some problems. Dynamic pages, the home page can have duplicate content. Posts, categories, tags, date, archives. There's a million places you can have this problem. So that's how you can kind of fix it. One way to identify it, a great tool we use, is called Screaming Frog. There's a free version. You basically can input your site into this tool. It'll traverse your site like a search engine would. And it'll kick out all the different pages. And you can easily see where you have duplicate content, as well as many other issues. Uh, another one, duplicate images. So when you upload an image, you want to make sure that you don't have an attachment page in WordPress. So this is a WordPress specific issue. Uh, you want to make sure you know you uh, select none. So that's an easy one to fix. You also, while you're in here, you want to make sure you add all text. So all text is text that describes what the image is. It's meant for the visually impaired so that they know what that content is about. But that's a great thing to optimize within the uh, image. Uh, so if you have duplicate content, uh, a lot of times it's already there. First of all, you won't have duplicate content in the first place. You want to avoid it. But if you do happen to have duplicate content, what you can do is a redirect. So three or one redirect. So you want to send the content from, you want to redirect the content from page from one uh, place to the other. And so the way I always explain what this is, is uh, you buy a house, right? Say you bought a house. Let's say you're living in an apartment or you're living in another house. Let's, let's make it simple. I have house one, I'm moving in house two. I'm moving. So what do I do? I want to make sure I get my mail, right? So I tell the nice post office, say, hey, take my mail from here and bring it to this house. That's basically a three or one to read, read right. It tells Google and anyone else that visits, don't go to this page, go to this one now. And it's 301 because that's a permanent redirect. There's other kinds of redirects you should be aware of, like 302, that's a temporary redirect. That means I'm just vacation. I'm only going to my summer home. 301 redirect in the case of duplicate content is really what you want. And this is good because it passes the value. So if you have links to that old page, you want to have it here because those links will carry over. You do have some decay in the value because you're not going to the initial page. Uh, but that is the best practice for dealing with duplicate content. Uh, so to do that, um, I use simple 301 redirects. There's other plugins you can use. I like this one because you can upload a spreadsheet of uh, links you want to redirect. I haven't actually tried this, but I found it, so I thought it was pretty cool. HD Access Editor, if you want to be fancy and use regular expressions and get into the code, uh, you can use this, which will tell you exactly what the program, or you can learn you know, HD Access. <laughs> but this is a shortcut if you're not familiar with it. Uh, permalink set setting. Uh, so permalink is, I think the speaker before was talking about this. This is really how um, your URL is viewed. And so you don't want to use the default setting of question mark P equals one, two, three, right? You want to have it custom because it's, it's better for the users, it's more understandable, better for the search engines. So um, and on the Big Fish site, we use category post name. Uh, you can also do post name. A lot of it depends on the size of the site, the hierarchy you want, you want to create. You want to have a relatively flat site. If it's a bigger site, you want to have more hierarchy. Uh, and a lot of times you can put keywords in those uh, permalinks as well. And that, that can help out a little bit. XML sitemaps. So you want to make sure your site is easy, uh, easily accessible by the search engines. One way to do that is through your XML sitemaps. So you can generate these. One tool to do that is Google XML sitemaps. Um, Yoast will do this as well. Uh, and the purpose of this is for the search engines, not for people. Uh, you can do an HTML site map for people so it's easy for people to find the content. But this is really specific for the search engines. So it generates an XML file of all the content on your site. You can then submit this via Google Webmaster Tools, the, the tool I mentioned way at the beginning on slide two. Uh, and then you can also not only um, submit your content, meaning your, your text content, your posts and your pages, you can also submit images, you can uh, submit video, you can do a mobile sitemap. There's all sorts of really great things you can do with XML sitemaps that adds a lot of value to your optimization. Page layout structure. So I talked about accessibility, I talked about kind of high level SEO. 
Uh, I won't spend a ton of time here because it's a deep subject. I'm trying to give you a kind of brush stroke so you understand uh, the main points and you can research in detail yourselves later. But another thing to consider is the page layout and structure. So, you know, I always find good SEO is like being a good writer. Like, you know, like if you're a newspaper writer, you want to have a hierarchy, right? You want to have the headline at the top. Uh, you know, you want to have it easily to read, lots of bullets, very readable. And so this comes into play for SEO as well. So it's a good idea to have a hierarchy of content, meaning there's a structure to it. Uh, I don't use the keywords meta tag anymore. That's kind of outdated. I wouldn't advise using that. You want to make sure you have good images that are, are loading quickly. Uh, you want to have clean uh, layout for your page. Make it skimmable, like I mentioned before, images bullet points, etc. not war and peace. You don't want to have a super long post. Break that up instead and do several posts. Be consistent, so the layout you have on one page, have it in another blog post, use lots of white space. So that's not super deep, but it's enough to give you somewhere to get started. Uh, microdata. So microdata is useful specifically for, well, lots of things, but uh, you can do local schema which will tell uh, Google the attributes of the page. So if you have a local listing on Yelp, they will have different schema that indicates this is the business's name, this is the business's address, this is the business's uh, street, etc. Uh, they also can use this for reviews, so they can say this is a review. So it's basically telling the search engines what that specific content is. So that way they can build up their database and share that information directly. Uh, so uh, more real estate, uh, this gives you generally more real estate on that page, and it helps you link to specific content. So this is a good way to take advantage of the search results and differentiate your website from everyone else's. So schema is a great thing, it's very useful, we use it all the time. Uh, yeah, this one, right? well this is, uh, what I reference here is actually a, a creator. So this is not a plugin, this specific resource here. This is Raven. So Raven SEO tools has great tools. You input the information, it'll spell out the code. And a lot of times you get, for instance, if it's a local site, you can take the code and put that in your footer of your website and have that information right there. So it's easy to find. A lot of local sites, it's a good idea to have the address on every page of the site in the footer. Security and spam, I won't spend a ton of time because there was someone speaking about this that knows far more than I can ever know about this. But uh, I will tell you, number one, keep your site up to date because that's, that's just a no-brainer. Make sure it's secure because getting your site hacked is not a good signal from a Google's perspective. You can limit the login attempts. Spam, that can, you know, they didn't talk about it before, but that can slow down your site because that fills up your database. That will slow the site down. And also, if it's published, it doesn't really look good at all. Uh, and then Webmaster Tools, as I mentioned before, can notify you. Uh, you know, Jetpack has some great tools for that. And for commenting, we actually use Discuss on our site. Tony, does Jetpack conflict with Yoast? No. Well, there's different uh, plugins within Jetpack that you can use. So, you know, the, the one I was speaking of specifically here is a security plugin. I can't remember the name of it, but it's pretty good. Oh, actually, Brute Protect. A friend of mine actually developed that, so I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate of him, actually. <laughs> so, um, good question, though. Uh, this is kind of neat. So, test your site speed. There's lots of really cool tools. Again, this is not my area of expertise, but I'm going to hit on it and in, 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 in how it pertains to SEO. GT Metrics, you can run some really cool reports that tells you how you can optimize your site for to make it a little bit quicker. Google Developer has some great uh, tools as well. Ping them with page tests. Uh, later on, uh, I have a guide that gives you some of these resources. We'll put the links in there. That way you can uh, get these tools so you don't have to worry about writing them down. Improving your site speed. Again, uh, I'm not going to get into this in detail. Great hosting, clean up your database, deactivate plugins. A lot of the stuff was hit before. Uh, what we use, oh, WP3, I think you mentioned that. I like that one a lot because you can kind of see where you're getting uh, um, slow it up. Jetpack, we talked about that. WP Smush, I use that. I don't have a problem with it. I don't want to overtax my server anyway, so I don't have a problem doing that. We don't have that many images. Uh, and we happen to use W3 Total Cache. I like that plugin a lot. 
create internal links. Okay, so you have great uh, visibility or accessibility, I should say. Uh, so what do you do with your content? Well, one thing you want to do is cross-link your content. So you can do that through this plugin, yet another related post, post plugin. So we'll, at the end of the post, it'll show uh, other posts that are similar to it that you can cross-link from the original post. Uh, the other thing you can do is use bread, breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs. Those are really good for search engines because they can kind of see the hierarchy of the site. Also, give you some cross links. Uh, linking in side posts. That's a great thing because that will help your SEO. It also coincidentally will help your conversion rate. So you know, there's a lot of studies about that. But linking from within your post is a natural way to drive better results from a conversion as well as from an SEO perspective. Uh, and then, of course, use the assets you have. So you have a sidebar. You can post, uh, cross promote content there. The footer is a good place. Although you got to be careful there. You don't want to be too spammy. You can use your footer. And then obviously, the menu, making sure you have the right navigation in place that fits your hierarchy. Make sure it's logical. Post grade content. So uh, this is kind of the, the uh, meat of everything, right? Because in my view, uh, a website is really a collection of content really all it is. And so you want to have great content. One way to do that is an editorial calendar. Uh, you know, we, we use a couple different tools, but I did come across a WordPress plugin that will help you do that. A video is very powerful because it helps your engagement because people tend to stay on your site longer when you use video. Uh, and so what you want to look at is what's your bounce rate. So how many people are coming to the page and leaving? You want to look at uh, the time spent on each site, which is kind of similar. As I mentioned, a content calendar, having a strategy to your content uh, is very important. Obviously, watch your grammatical and spelling errors, errors, but that's very important because if you don't have readable content, it's not a good signal for Google. And as I mentioned, video, very, very important nowadays. Leveraging social media, uh, so make sure your content is shareable. There's a number of plugins out there that can help you do that. We use Sumo Me on our site. Uh, click Click to tweet, which is a bit of a tongue twister, <laughs> but we use that. Uh, so leveraging social plugins is important. And also retargeting. So retargeting is something uh, that can be very powerful. So what this is, is someone sees your content, they go somewhere else on the internet, but whether it's Facebook, maybe they go to read content on a news site like USA Today or CNN, and what do they see? They see a banner ad for you that says come back and finish reading this article or this related article. So maybe you have a part one and part two, right? Because we talked about before not writing war and peace. Maybe you break this long post down to three parts. And so you know someone came to your site, they read part one, how much sense would it be to have the continuing story and read part two? This happens all the time with TV, right? Hence the series, everybody likes to see the next stage. You can do the same thing with your digital marketing strategy and leverage SEO with your social and your retargeting strategy. So the power comes in, in um, using multiple assets at the same time. So you don't want to just do SEO or just think about content. And that's kind of the reason we built our system the way we did, because it's a track, lure, catch. We're hitting all three of those, those drivers. And so you can do that yourselves by getting kind of great content, have it optimized, retarget it. Very powerful combination that helps your business grow quickly. And lastly, uh, you know, if you want to have these slides, if you want to have a guide on exactly how we do this, then just uh, give me your, your business card after, and we'll email you our WordPress SEO guide and checklist. It has a checklist of things you can do to improve this site, as well as any other site. It talks about SEO uh, in general, as well as uh, WordPress. So uh, any questions? Yes? What are you using for the retargeting? Uh, there's a number of tools. Uh, there's really two kinds of retargeting. So there's what's called list-based retargeting, and there's a pixel-based retargeting. So pixel-based retargeting is what I had just mentioned. And that's where someone goes to your website, you identify that person, and then when they go on other places on the internet, they identify. That's pixel-based. Uh, list-based is really based on someone's email address. So you can literally take an email list, upload that to Facebook, or you can upload it to Google and target those people. So we'll use networks, we have a variety. AdRoll's great, uh, Google has one, Facebook has one, there's a bunch of really powerful tools. And we actually wrote a guide on retargeting 
uh, that you know I can send you if you want to give me a business card. But it talks about what's the difference between those two and when to use which which tactic. Great question though. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, let me ask you about calendars. You showed a rather basic calendar there. Yeah. We don't actually use either one of those. What we do is, well, we do, uh, if you ever read Anne Hanley, and, and uh, she's a great, she wrote, yeah, you're being busy. Yeah. She has a rule called 1720, or 1730, 421. So there's some things you write daily, some things you write weekly, and monthly, etc. And so what we do is we build our own tool uh, with uh, a lot. First iteration was uh, Google Spreadsheets. We also use a variety of project management tools. We like write a lot, and so what we'll do is we'll use those tools and publish that. That way, our clients can uh, authorize it and then it can get distributed out. So we use that, and what, kind of what we're moving toward is more proprietary tools that leverage APIs to post content directly after there's been approval. So there's a whole process and sequence in, uh, in place for that. But yes, I'm familiar with both of those. Uh, I can't really give a great answer on that, though. I would have to ask my social media person. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Is that referring to internal links? Yes, those are called internal links. So there's two kinds of links. There's external links and internal links. Internal links are basically linking within your site. External links are, are linking to places outside your link. So if you're linking to, uh, if I have my, uh, I'm doing this talk today, and I say I had a great time at Word, uh, WordPress Boston meetup, I would then uh, link to the .org site, and that would be an external. So those are the differences. Uh, from an SEO perspective, they both have value, but really what I was talking about is internal links, which has more value. You said you had a question. Blank or when you have an external link, you put on a blank tab or just go straight? Uh, so one more time. So if I have an external link. Oh, uh, I tend to do a blank window, a new window. Because I like for to, external. Ex for the external links, yes. It depends on where you're going. You know, even for some of our own content, we could post to another tab in the browser. Uh, but sometimes you want to make sure you're, you're linking directly. So as a case in point, say I have a landing page and it has a call to action. A lot of times we will link directly to that page and that page is not having navigation to go anywhere else because we want to push them through a specific marketing funnel. In that case, we went and opened up a new window and we would drive them specifically to what we want the user to do and not have any navigation at all. So it really depends on your strategy. So what I found in marketing is there's no one size fit all. Really, you have to look at your strategy and align the tactics with that strategy, and then that's kind of how you make the decision on which way to go. Good question, though. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you were talking about internal linking. Um, I, I can get very cumbersome. I can't. Uh, you're adding new pages all the time. Is there a plugin that you could, like, uh, uh, Yes, there are plugins. There are plug I can't remember all, any off the top of my head, but there are plugins where you can say any time you see this text link to this particular page. You just have to be careful not to be too spammy. And you definitely don't want to link to, so the one thing you definitely want to do if you use a plugin like that, you want to limit it to just one iteration of the page. Because if you have the same anchor text over and over again, you might have like you know, 10, 10 times on page and that's extremely spammy. Yeah, or in a headline. Correct, so you have to be very careful. There are plugins. I can't recall the names of them off the top of my head, but there are some plugins that do that. Yeah. Yes. So about the three on one redirect. Yep. So, for example, if I want to redirect from the www mm -hmm. to the non www right. can it be or vice versa? Uh. Okay. Yeah. To fix that, you can use the HE access rule. So you can say redirect one versus the other, and the way you decide which one to redirect to is based upon what we do is we determine which one has the better authority from a link perspective. And so we'll rank the, like the big fish site, we've never used the www. So we were, we rank, we uh, redirect the, the page that doesn't have the www. So the first step, first step is to decide, okay, which one has more authority? The second step is to execute on that. And you do that, usually the way we do it is through an HTX, HD access rule Within WordPress, though, it usually defaults to one version. So it may not, may not even be an issue for WordPress at all. Typically, you just choose one version or the other and problem solved. But 
if for some reason your configuration is weird, or if you're not, God forbid, developing a WordPress or something else, then, uh, then you can use that HD access rule. Good question. Yes? What do you think about um, people who do, use a site like Blogger or something like that to do external blogging and then point back to the site, or should all blogging be on the original site? I prefer blogging on the original site. Uh, because you think about it, it depends on what your goals are and what your site is. I mean, there's an argument for using an external site because it can give you some link authority. That's great. But, you know, I think I'm geared to think about results. I put in the name, Big Fish Results. Uh, so that, to me, that means driving sales, driving leads, etc. And so the best way to do that is to leverage your blog, get people come into your site and drive into a call to action. So it's much more tightly integrated that way. So, for instance, our blog posts, at the bottom of every post, there's a call to action to go to a landing page. Or there's like a pop-out that will say, get this content, and drive someone through the process. It's a little harder to do when you're using an external plugin. It's not as integrated or tightly wound. Not, not to mention analytics. So if you're tracking results, you know, if you have one set of analytics code here, one set of analytics here, how do you tie them together? Much more, I mean, you can do it, but it's much more complicated. So I like an integrated approach much, much more. So to follow up on something you just said, so at the bottom of every blog post is a specific call. To so you don't just, it's not just there. It's not just readable content. You actually you put something in to have people take action. Correct. Yeah. There's every every site is done. Every post is strategic. So there's a reason behind it. Whether it's building brand authority, thought leadership, or ultimately to drive someone to a conversion, we try. And actually, there's, here's a good example. So what I mentioned today, because uh, we try to eat our own cooking as much as possible. So I, what did I say? I said, if you want the guide, uh, just give us a business card and. Uh, we'll give that to you. Well, that's that's kind of a, a soft sell, honestly. Uh, but say, for instance, you're reticent and you want to do that because I'm scared. What you can do is you go to our website, and I will do a blog post that's a recap of this meeting right here. You go there, and it has a summary. I'm actually going to put these slides up there, too. So I'm giving value. I'm giving value, giving value. And at the end, there's a call to action. What does the call to action say? It says, download our guide. You get the guide. You get the content. And you'll get a lot of value of that, uh, and that's that's how it works. It, it's very effective. Yes. Uh, regarding permalinks, say you say you have a structure already, you did a custom permalink structure, but you decided there's a better way to do it. Yeah. When you change it, is you can tweak it once. All all the links, all the um, links that already exist, are going to automatically redirect to the no, new you, you have to, That's why you have to do the free one so redirect. Okay. Yeah, and if you have a massive site, you really want to use HD access. So if you have you know 20 pages, then the WordPress uh, you know uh, plugin I, I mentioned before is great. But if you have a thousand pages, you'd be up all night, right? So you want to use HD access rules, and plus it'll be more reliable. Uh, but I will tell you, generally you want to keep the structure because there's huge red flags when you change everything that dramatically. It just leads a lot of problems. So I like to keep it simple and try to move everything over and make it clean. If you absolutely have to, though, use HD access for a larger site and make sure they're all 301 redirect. Is there a way to keep the structure of the old one then update and move posts? Uh, yeah, I mean, so as, as long as you have the same, uh, you know, basically what you want to do is make sure the pages are named the same thing. So if it said, you know, uh, red slash sweater on your Drupal site, you move over to the WordPress, just make sure it has the same permanent structure, then problem solved. And so when we when we um, go through our process for an SEO, we always say, okay, what's the easiest path? And what do they have today? And what will it look like in the future? If it's not that much of a dramatic change, we'll just move it over and make sure the permalink settings are consistent. If, if we find there's no way to uh, leverage that, then we'll do three or one redirects. And sometimes you don't have to do three or one redirect all. Maybe the red sweaters are fine, but the gray ones are not. So then you want to you know, uh, adapt for that. Okay. Yes? Tony, of all your big fish results and clients, which has been your biggest success? Biggest success? Oh, boy. The one you uh, call your mother about. Well, the one I like, I, so I like unusual clients. So my background was working in verticals. So I did a lot of automotive, for instance. And so I decided when I started my own agency, I wanted to work with a variety of clients. I wanted to work with clients that were kind of quirky and, and unusual. So one of my favorites is this company called Cyclus. And what they do is they do underwater sonar equipment. So you know like when that jet went down out in, I don't know where? Not no, not, no, this was out in uh, Malaysia. Malaysia. Yeah. 
they use their equipment to find uh, them. So they have underwater sonar. So we took them, and they had literally nothing. Like they had just they were they weren't going nowhere. And so we um, optimized their site, did some retargeting, some paid search, and they made. You know, I can't even say how much, but they made multiple, 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 multiple six figures after under through a very small investment. And so, if you go to Big Fish, here's another example of a call to action, by the way. If you go to Big Fish results, you'll find a case study for them. You can download it, and there's also a video of the vice president speaking about the phenomenal results he had, and that's available right on our website. And uh, you can download it and read it for yourself. Good talk. Thanks. Thanks.